right, so we're here at Low Carb Denver 2020, and I've literally met Siobhan about a minute ago, and I'm here to have a chat to interview her. Um, so Siobhan, tell me a little bit about yourself and where you come from. Yeah, so I was raised in Indiana, um, and from the age of 10 or 11, I started getting um, depression symptoms, so chronic depression. Um, I also started gaining weight around the same time, and I was really active at the time. I was in gymnastics and swimming and just climbing trees and all that stuff. Um, and I was still that active when I started gaining weight. Um, and because of the depression, I actually quit all of those hobbies, unfortunately. And then that only kind of made the weight gain worse, I think. So that was an issue for a long time, just continually gaining weight. Um, my highest weight so far has been 240 pounds. Um, and I am 5'2", so that's a lot <laughs> for me. Um, I also had hypertension by the time I was 18. Um, the doctor I had at the time was not at all happy. Um, and he got on me about having high cholesterol too. And my like good cholesterol was low at the time and triglycerides were high. So it was definitely something if I saw now, I would kind of want to address. But what he told me was that you can eat grass and drink water and your cholesterol won't change. So um, I fired him and decided to try and lose weight over and over again because I figured that was the way to get healthy. If I just get the weight off, then my blood pressure will go down, all that type of stuff. Um, so I tried calorie restricting, more exercise, like all this stuff. And I would lose like 10 or 15 pounds, but then I'd gain it all back again or I would just not lose anything in the first place. Um, but I was about to do even more uh, calorie restriction and I went into my mom's office like, all right, I'm going to do this again. And she was like, hold on, hold on. I've been looking into this thing called keto. Why don't we do it together? Because my mom was also um, obese at the time and I know she had like a lifelong struggle with her weight as well. So we started keto together a little bit later that month, and that was in August of 2016. And I've been on a ketogenic diet ever since, so about three and a half years, I think. And I've lost 80 pounds. My chronic depression went into remission. Um, I used to have chronic joint and back pain, and that's gone. Uh, eczema, that's gone. Keratosis pilaris is another type of eczema. That is mostly gone. Like, all of the issues that I had have just disappeared. <laughs> Oh, okay. Yeah, that's inc that's incredible, incredible story. And you uh, you also say that you uh, follow a carnivore diet. Yeah. Right? So yeah. after about a year into keto, um, I had gone to Keto Fest 2017, and um, I had met two people there who kind of changed things for me a lot. Uh, number one was Amber O'Hearn. She's been carnivore now for 10 years, and she had um, given a presentation at Keto Fest that I had seen and it was talking about you know ketosis is the human advantage and babies are in ketosis when they're born and like all this type of stuff and further conversation with her made me think okay maybe I don't need to have you know all these vegetables every day I'll just eat the ones that I like so over the course of that um, over the next couple months I had started reducing my plant intake, reducing my plant intake, until eventually it was like, well, there's hardly anything left here, so I'll just go full carnivore for a month and see what happens. And as is true for <laughs> kind of quite a few of people who try carnivore for a month, uh, I ended up liking it so much that I just have stuck with it since then. Uh, so, so with your carnivore diet, I uh, assume that's not just eating steaks. Do you, <laughs> do you, what kind of animal products are you eating? Yeah, so I eat all, um, pretty much all animal products that I enjoy. So that includes dairy, um, animal fats, steak, pork chops, chicken wings, fish. Um, I don't eat liver because I don't enjoy it. <laughs> and I've experimented quite a lot with that and it's just not something that I can do and enjoy, so I don't eat it. Um, but I do eat things like bone marrow or lamb brain that we get from a local farm. Um, I do enjoy heart too, so pretty much anything that comes from an animal and I enjoy it, I eat it. Okay, that's interesting. Have you um, interacted with any doctors um, 
and told them about your carnivore diet. I'd be interested to hear about their yeah. reaction to that. So I interact with a lot of carniv or a lot of doctors um, just in the low carb sphere, and for them it's kind of oh okay whatever. Um, but my family doctor, um, I had been going to. I started going to him about six months after I had gone low carb. And so I had been telling him about like all these improvements. And then the next year I was carnivore and I was just kind of keeping him updated. Like I'm not gonna <laughs> deceive him or anything about what I'm doing. Um, so I told him I was carnivore for the past year or so. Um, and I don't have scurvy by the way. I don't have any symptoms of scurvy, nothing like that. Um, here's all the things that got better. And I handed him like this big list of lab tests that I had gotten and he kind of flipped through it and he was like, well, everything looks good, so cool. <laughs> so I do keep him up to date on the uh, research that I do, on research coming out of the low carb community. Like my last appointment, I brought in studies published by um, Verda talking about type two diabetes and fatty liver and type two um, and keto and stuff like that. And so I'll try and keep him as informed as possible because he's not, really a low carb advocate, but he does have low carb patients, so um, kind of helps to summarize for him. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and you mentioned earlier that you've been working with Dave Fellman. Is that, is yeah, that right? so that was the second person I met at KetoFest who kind of changed things. Um, Dave Feldman is originally a software engineer, but he's gotten very much into self-studying the lipid system, so cholesterol, LDL, HDL, all that type of stuff. And he also gave a presentation at that first Keto Fest, and that is where I met him in person um, in, for the first time. So I started talking to him there after he had given his presentation, and one thing that had stood out to me from that is he was talking about how cholesterol metabolism, cholesterol metabol oh my God. <laughs> he was talking about how cholesterol metabolism is very much like an object-oriented network. And at the time, I had been working in IT uh, at a help desk, and I was doing some scripting. So I was like, oh, I know what that is. I talk to my dad about that all the time. And so every single time there was an open seat next to Dave um, at the dinners or whatever, I would immediately sit down and be like, OK, so tell me about this. Tell me about this. Tell me about this. What do you think about this? And um, I had gotten his cell phone number as well, so I was texting him on the way back from Keto Fest on the bus, like what resources do you recommend? What textbooks do you recommend? Like how do I get started learning this stuff? And ever since then, that was July 2017, I've been studying um, cholesterol metabolism and I got especially interested in um, how cholesterol and cholesterol metabolism relates to the immune system. And from there it's kind of expanded out to how the immune system is involved in metabolic syndrome and how inflammation plays a role in all of it and not really in the way that people talk about it. Um, so that's something we can get into if you'd be interested. So the research that you're doing, are you, are you publishing that for the, for the public to read on websites or blogs? Yeah, so I do publish a lot at cholesterolcode.com, um, which is Dave Feldman's site as well. So I have articles on um, atherosclerosis and my kind of view on how certain portions of that happen. I have a post on LDL and the immune system and how those two interact and its special function there. Um, so I do post a lot there. And I also have a side blog that I started more recently, um, which is dendritica.home.blog, where I post more about, um, I have a post going about um, uh, kind of how to use the tools that we have in research appropriately. So how to interpret evidence from mouse studies, kind of how to read them, um, being aware of different terminology in different groups. So often the term high fat diet is used to mean a high fat Western diet or an obesogenic diet, which is very different from how people in the low carb community look at high fat. They tend to think high fat, low carb, healthy fats, and that's often not what is used in the research, which can make the headlines a little bit misleading. So I kind of talk about um, sort of similar things, but more loose, and I tend to be a little bit more sarcastic on that blog. <laughs> okay, yeah, I think that's a great point about the animals, animal studies. Um, I mean, Dave Feldman also has uh, some ideas about the, the LDL that shoots up when some people that go on a, 
a very low co um, carbohydrate diet. Do you have any comments about that? Yeah. Um, so in the low carb community, if you spend any amount of time in it, eventually you'll hear the term hyper responder. A hyper responder is someone who goes on a low carb diet and they see their LDL go up. Um, sometimes that's a little bit, sometimes that's a lot, but usually this is paired with higher HDL, which is referred to as the good cholesterol, and lower triglycerides, and high triglycerides are associated with higher risk of things like uh, cardiovascular disease, so all of that is very important. But there's also a certain select group called lean mass hyperresponders, and these are people who are on low carb diets, carnivorous diets, ketogenic diets. They tend to be on the leaner side, normal weight or very athletic looking, um, and sometimes very fit and active. And they'll see the same sort of pattern, but their HDL will be very high, like commonly seen in the 80s, 90s, 100s. Um, their HDL will be rock bottom, below 70, where under 100 is like considered good. Uh, and their LDL will be super high, above 200, and that's like in the tearing your hair out, your doctor is screaming at you in horror kind of level. And Dave kind of got interested in this profile and he started noticing it because when he had gone low carb um, to address prediabetes, he saw his own cholesterol shoot up. He didn't have a whole ton of weight to lose, so when he did lose it and rechecked, it was like, oh my God, what am I going to do? This is horrifying. And he started researching it, and he's found a lot of compelling evidence and research that he's done in the supporting literature that says that these VLDL particles, which is the precursor for LDL, which is what you often hear about, they carry triglycerides from your own fat stores and deliver it to cells to provide them energy. And if you just eat a fatty meal, you'll have these other guys, these big, big honking guys, called chylomicrons that will essentially do the same thing. But the difference is chylomicrons are transporting energy primarily from the gut, so what you've just eaten, versus VLDL, which is carrying uh, primarily your own fat stores. And chylomicrons will be cleared from the blood in, say, 12 to 14 hours of not eating. And so will VLDL. But the difference is chylomicrons will just be taken up and cleared out. And some of that will happen to VLDL, but also what will also happen is it will be remodeled to LDL. So the way Dave kind of thinks about this from experiments that he's done and the, the studies that we both have read is it could be that people are seeing higher levels of LDL because they're relying on fat for energy. So they need to use these lipoproteins, these um, kind of like boats in the bloodstream that are carrying this fat that can't mix with the water. So as you're like turning over those VLDL, you have some that will become LDL, and that could partially explain what we're seeing. And he's done experiments where he'll eat super, super high fat, so he'll need to re rely less on his own stores of fat, and voila, his LDL will go down in the space of three days. And I've replicated this, we've had you know, probably 100 to 200 people or, or more. Uh, we haven't done a check recently, but it's a lot of people who have replicated this experiment uh, and seen the same result. And likewise, if you fast, if you don't eat, especially for multiple days, you know, over 14 hours into the 24 multiple day range, you'll see that your LDL will go up. And that could be because you're relying on your own body stores, so you have to rely on that VLDL more. And as a result, you'll have kind of the wrappers left over, which is the LDL from the energy that you've used. So this kind of brings into question if the high LDL we're seeing associating with risk of atherosclerosis and all this type of stuff, is it in that same context of energy reliance or is there another context for it? And in fact, there is. So another thing that can increase LDL and cause, um, or at least is associated with uh, atherogenic dyslipidemia, so that's low HDL, low good cholesterol, um, high triglycerides, and a lot of these small particle type of um, LDL, is it associates with insulin resistance and inflammation and all this type of stuff. So now you have two different contexts where this can happen. 
And really the question that needs to be answered, uh, there are some studies that have looked at it a little bit, but it still needs more investigation is, are those two contexts the same for high LDL, where if you do have the desirable, generally desirable profile of high HDL and low triglycerides, is it as high risk as they are saying, you know, high LDL in a context where you have low HDL and high triglycerides, so metabolic syndrome. And there are things like uh, Framingham that have looked at this um, and these other types of things, and that gives us a hint of what may be happening uh, where they're showing there's not an increase in risk or very, very tiny increase in risk for people who have high HDL, high, uh, high LDL, and low triglycerides versus people who have you know, low or normal LDL, but high HDL and low triglycerides. But if you look at people who have high triglycerides and low HDL, regardless of what their LDL is, it's just not spilling good news. But those are observational studies, and we really just need more. And what would really help if we were able to look at lean mass hyperresponders directly and follow them over a period of time where these are people who all of their other metabolic markers are sparkling clean except for the LDL, and if you follow them over a year or five years or what have you, like are they developing heart disease at a rapid rate? That's the question I think that needs to be answered, and it hasn't been looked at yet, um, but Dave and I have also set up um, the Citizen Science Foundation, where proceeds from that are going to funding a measurement project to look at lean mass hyperresponders and see what happens, because I, I think it would take too long if we waited, but at the very least, this may act as you know, encouragement for other researchers out there to replicate this and see if they get the same result, see if you know, with a wider amount of people participating, they see the same thing, and at least get a little bit of a hint that may inspire further answers down the road. Okay, um, yeah, that's very comforting to hear because I am one of those uh, hyper responders and I did go onto a ketogenic diet and I was very active and fairly lean at the time. And then when I did my fasting uh, lipogram, the LDL was super high, but everything else was uh, sparkling. So uh, my immediate reaction was to get quite a fright, even though I wasn't that concerned about L LDL. It went up so high that it's hard to ignore. So it's good to hear. Yeah, and that story is definitely not uncommon, especially in people who weren't particularly overweight when they started. Uh, because if you're coming from a place where you're type 2 diabetic, you're obese, it tends to take a long time to come back from that, you know, several years. But then once they do get lean, we start seeing people come to cholesterol code and say, my LDL has now gone higher, I don't get it, I'm healthy in every way, like why is this happening? And studies on why it is happening, what are the mechanisms behind it, um, are important, and then also answering that question about risk or at least getting more, figuring out what questions we need to ask in association with that, I think is gonna be really important moving forward. Okay, great, thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Yes, thank you.